Okay, now um, I've returned back into the real world and I'm kind of quite dealing with the actual process uh, of the 3D printing. Um, so uh, the workflow is we've just spoken about, you know, inevitably, and I think I hope I said this at the beginning of um, the whole sort of sessions that, uh, you know, people see the 3D printers and say, ah, that's what I want to do. And I always make the point that ultimately that is only the machine for putting the output. Your ideas, you know, they really happen back here in the digital file. So, you know, you'd need to be able to um, make your file and be prepared to deal with computers and kind of all of that stuff. And, and that's the interesting part for me. So anyway, now you've got your digital file. Um, obviously, if you work in Blender, it's going to be a Blender file. Rhino, it's going to be a Rhino file. Psst, any other program, most packages have their own file type. So you need to then find the export button and you export it as an either an STL or an OBJ. So STL OBJ has become like the generic 3D files, a bit like JPEG is for photography. Um, now, certainly if you are exporting out of Rhino, there are further buttons that say something about whether you want it high, high, high quality, low quality, this, that, and the other. And you're going to have to exper um, experiment with that as to kind of what's right for you. Um, I, I've had trouble with uh, Rhino files not slicing very well for one reason or other in um, the uh, Cura. Um, but I think it's about the way that um, export has been done. But anyway, so then the work file, uh, work uh, flow, obviously, probably on a memory stick, or uh, if it's on your own computer, you just um, import this STL file into your slicing program. And I'll show you a screen grab of that in a moment. So this is another piece of software. And uh, that takes that sort of chicken mesh three-dimensional chicken mesh and makes it into a bunch of pancakes, basically two-dimensional flat profiles that all build up, up, up. And uh, that then pushes out something known as a G-code file. So as I say, these printers and CNC machines, cutting machines and all that um, use G-code. Now robot arms don't, they tend to have a code of their own uh, and going from here to robot arm, is actually a much, much more com um, um, complicated uh, and actually is something I, I haven't got involved in. Um, a little bit because Rhino is the best package to do that. So if by any chance you're going down the kind of the robot arm route, then you want to be working over here in Rhino and then you would go straight from your Rhino through Grasshopper. Grasshopper becomes your slicing program. Uh, and that goes then off to your robot arm. So then I go into preparing my clay. So I do my kind of clean work and I put um, this G-code file onto a little SD card and the little SD card gets put into the printer. And you can also have a USB connection, um, but I tend to keep my laptop away from the printer. That's, that's all. So then we go over to preparing clay and I'll talk about that and then the actual printing techniques. So kind of looking at uh, clay, oh, sorry, this is still the, the slicing. Now, there are a number of softwares that will do the slicing, a number of free ones. Um, gosh, of, uh, Slicer 3R is, I think, the other popular um, uh, free one. Uh, and all of these are, are packages that have been developed for plastic printing. None of them have been developed particularly for ceramic printing. Uh, and so you actually, you know, when you open these or download, so Cura is coming out of the Netherlands uh, and is part of Ultimaker. So Ultimaker makes uh, plastic printers uh, and they offer the Cura slicing program for free from their website. So you, both of those search names would get you there. Uh, you download it and then you actually have to set it up. Um, and uh, I've got video of that and I'll point you to that right at the end. Um, but uh, anyway, then I would uh, load in my file and then down the bottom here, when it loads in, it says slice, you press the button slice and that mesh then gets turned into what I call the pancakes. 
And then we've got a slider. This isn't real action, but a slider. I can pick, pull it up and down, and it then rises and lowers through the pancakes. And you can just check that all your layers are looking good. Um, and at the moment, you can see a bit of yellow and red, and that is because my printing I always do with two layers, you know, sort of an outer skin and an inner skin, and that's just for strength. Inevitably, the print takes twice as long, but I have to just live with that, and it gives me, you know, much better stability to the pieces. Uh, anyway, the whole kind of setting up this cure uh, is another story when I'm in the, in the studio with you, or if you're really keen, uh, as I say, I'll point you to the video so you can set it up yourself. Um, but as I say, then I would save as the G code onto the SD card, off that goes. So then clay preparation. Um, it's, I suggest that it's best to work from clay that is already wet, and we'll get to that in a moment. So I've taken a bag of clay with a wire, I've cut it into tiles, and then with just a household fork, I've forked through and then literally just add water to it and then keep mushing with the fork, mush, 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 and then get in with my hands and really using the tips of the hands. So you could, you know, sort of try printing with this, but it'll then be hard, soft. And as it gets extruded out, it'll go fast and slow and, you know, you won't get a good quality um, print. And I have to say, the better the clay preparation, the better the result at the end of the day. Um, or the better the print. So then I've, you know, I found the best way is just using the tips of my fingers, I drag through the clay and then slap it down onto the mound, you know, and I go one way and then here I'm actually standing above it and sort of dragging up the sides and slapping it down on top. And then I work back and forwards, you know, three, possibly four times, but using the tips of the fingers, I can actually feel as to whether there are any lumps or not. Um, and I get the consistency kind of as I want to add more water or not. Um, I have mechanized this. Uh, now, if by any chance you have access to a, um, uh, a pug mill, it can be done in a pug mill, but you really do need a, um, a de-airing pug mill, a pug mill that has got a compressor attached to it. Now, a de-airing pug mill, you put the clay in, and you actually switch on the compressor on suction and it sucks the air out of it. But what happens is what we're doing is you use the pug mill as a mixer just to you know, break up the clay and to mix it to a nice consistency. And then you actually, most of these de-airing pug mills, you can reverse the compressor. So it's either applies, pre applies pressure or sucks away. And so you reverse it to apply pressure and that then actually pushes the clay out of the machine because this clay is so soft that in actual fact, the blades of the uh, pug mill don't really grab it. You know, the pug mill tends to just go round and round and round and, and doesn't extrude the clay. But as soon as you put a bit of um, forced air behind it, it pushes it out. Uh, but anyway, the DIY, and I'm kind of always for the cheap DIY version is, you know, this is a, um, a, a, a mixer for plas builder's plaster. When you get them, they've got a big blade like this. These big blades set up too much resistance in the clay paste, uh, and they are well geared, but you know the, 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 the blades won't turn. So you can see, I shouldn't be telling you this, but I've cut these away. So there's just little blades, you know, I should be telling you in that I have no idea what the safety situation then is. Uh, but anyway, these little blades then cut up a bag of clay quite quickly. Um, and then I'm ready to go. Then this mix of clay, I'm back and forth again, back and forth. Um, actually filling a container. Now this is the big wasp container. The little machines that you've got have got smaller containers, uh, but you know the principle is much the same here. I've got a big um, uh, piece of wood that I stick up the back because there's actually a plunger in here and I push out any old clay. With the little machines, you're going to have to just scrape out any old clay to clean out the containers. I then check the consistency of clay. We'll talk about that in a moment. And you can see I'm just, um, and I'll do all this when I'm in on the 10th, but uh, press the container into the clay and then with my hands. So the little containers, you would just make balls of clay and press it in, press it in, making sure you're getting no air bubbles as you're pressing in. Uh, and then there's almost always some sort of plunger at the back 
because if you don't have a plunger, even in a small container, the air pushing it down uh, would take path of least resistance and it actually drills a hole down the middle if you don't have a plate of some form or other. So these have got quite a big plate and the lutum has got this little plastic plate we put on the end and that then gets attached to the machine. Okay, so a little bit about clays here. In that um, inevitable question, you know, what clay prints best? Um, and uh, I want to claim that all clays will print, but some clays print better than others. Uh, so it's a little bit kind of why is that? Um, and uh, there seem to be, you know, various different reasons, but these are kind of pointers to help you design if you're mixing up your own clays or which clay to go kind of go for. So um, as ceramics, the ceramic students might know all this and uh, apologies if you do, but uh, you know, the kind of the origins of clay. So over huge geological time, clay is actually rock that has been broken down um, due to force of um, uh, pressure and gases and so on and so forth. Um, and then is uh, kind of laid off as a primary clay. So any clay that is then uh, mined at the point of origin where the kind of geological time has taken place will be a, you know, potentially a white primary clay or China clay. Uh, and uh, so that is, you know, kind of at a point in the landscape, then that becomes weathered and moves through the landscape through, you know, waterborne or and water and rain moving through the landscape and uh, then gets redeposited in the landscape as ball clays that are slightly sort of gray gray colored clays obviously it's changed color because it point you know from point of origin where it was white it then has become contaminated by minerals you know in in uh, the general landscape uh, and then really low, uh, uh, bottom off kind of secondary clays or your brick clays and your terracotta clays at the lowest point in the environment. Now, obviously, this can be over huge geological time. So, you know, kind of where the mountains and the valleys are now might be quite different to when, you know, the clay was actually deposited. Um, but uh, kind of interestingly, there's a bit of a kind of analogy here between um, the way the clays, the, the, the character of these different clays as to how they work in the machines as well. And we'll, you will see this in a moment. Now, the other thing, um, again, hopefully ceramic students all know that these are electro um, magnified images of clay platelets, and they are platelets and not particles. So clay, um, and this is what actually gives it this character of plasticity, that clay isn't made out of little round dots like, say, wheat flour is. So if you're making uh, pizza, it is plastic, but it's not nearly as plastic as clay is. And that is because clay particles are these little platelets and the water then sticks between the platelets and they move over each, slide over each other, but are quite difficult to pull apart. Um, and so that gives you the sort of the plasticity of the movement, but also the strength. So all clays are sort of built of these platelets, but in actual fact, as the clay moves through the landscape, these platelets get broken up more and more and more and more. So, Although the clay, clay particles are very fine, your china clay has got, in fact, the biggest range of particles, and your terracotta clay that is, you know, right down at the end, moved through the landscape, is the finest clay, but also the stickiest clay. You know, as the particles get smaller, it gets more plastic, um, but it also gets stickier, and hence, you know, sculptors for modelling are using red clay rather than china clay. You know, cost might be something there, but uh, a very fine terracotta clay takes detail much, much better than, say, a china clay does. So the actual particle size of the clay particle is important, and that's represented in the landscape kind of thing. But then also just the makeup of the clay body. So a clay body, not your primary clays, because the china is pretty, the china clay is pretty. Um, uh, clean, but anything else after that found in the landscape is going to be probably got some sand in it and some silt, in other words, just other organic matter and other sort of ground up bits of dust and so on and so forth, and then the clay particles. And then I believe this that I grabbed off the internet, obviously, um, is drawn to scale, but I think it's a very a good visualization of 
you know, that's the representation of a clay particle. So clay isn't going to block your, your, your nozzles at all because your clay particles are like 0.0002 of a millimeter size. A sort of sand particle somewhere between two millimeters to 0.5 millimeters is that kind of size. And then silt particles that you say might be organic and so, and so forth is kind of a bit in between. Now, in designing clay bodies, you know, back for industry or, you know, sort of for um, artistic work or whatever, a good range of particle size helps the kind of the structure of the clay stand up. And that's what we're trying to find here for a printing clay is that you want it to be at one minute soft so that it would extrude nicely, but at the same time, you want it to dry quite quickly. So in actual fact, that the more sort of large quality um, bits you've got in it, the better it's going to dry because the, the water is going to evaporate out of big spaces much, much better, quicker than it's going to evaporate out of the clay particles. So by putting grog in helps clay dry better, uh, quicker and better and not distort so much. You can imagine you get a lot of distortion here because the clay, the water is coming out quite slowly, whereas something here, the water, like a big sort of open sponge, the water comes out easier. So when you're designing any body, you know, any clay body to work with, you know, these are considerations, particle size is consideration the whole time. During the worst of lockdown, I found it really difficult to kind of think creatively. Um, and uh, so it was a good time to get on and do a lot of tests around all those questions that I'd had in workshops. Um, and so I ran, first of all, this, this set of tests. And um, this is testing six different clays, as you can see. Um, and I printed them all as a six by six centimeter cylinder. And uh, so this is bone dry stage going across biscuit stage and cone six. It happens to be my maturing temperature, 12, 20 degrees. And uh, I think what's really interesting here is already at bone dry, you can see a difference in character. Um, and something like that, this is China clay. Yeah, I haven't got the list here, but it's, it's China clay and then a porcelain clay and then just a pure ball clay and then a, a, a fine stoneware clay, you know, really nice modern clay, and then a coarse stoneware clay and a red terracotta clay. But uh, real difference in size as they've just uh, dried to bone dry and also difference in, in um, proportion. You can see here, the proportion has stayed pretty even. So, you know, it's shrunk down from six by six, but the height is similar to the width. Whereas the China clay here, you can see, has already shrunk much more in the vertical than it has in the horizontal. And then the biscuit fire, the proportions change again a little bit. And then finally, at the cone six firing, you get much more of what I expected. And that is the China clay shrinking the most, going through to a very groggy stoneware clay shrinking the least. And I was surprised that the terracotta didn't shrink a lot. Normally, terracotta's shrink hugely, but I think this has got a lot of sand in it, and obviously sand then doesn't do the shrinking and so on and so forth. Um, but anyway, I, all of this kind of research I did document and at, at the end of this talk, I'll, I'll point you to places where you can find all this information if you really need it. You know, I, I'm giving you much more detail than you really need, but um, there we go. You can't complain that you weren't given detail during your MA course. Um, he has the six clays again and the list of the clays over there. So the question comes up is, all right, what consistency of clay should we be using? You know, how do you measure how soft the clay is that goes into the machine? How do you, and I, I, I'll show you my outcome for that. But one way of doing it is to say, okay, um, you know, you mix the same amount of water into the powder clay each time. So that's, you know, one way of doing it. The trouble is, and what I did here was take the clay, mix it all to the same consistency and then dry it out, is that different clays take different amounts of water. So the blue is the amount of water in, 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 the, in the clay. Um, so this is, say, is to get these different kind of um, clays to the same consistency. Uh, so it's not all of the same amount of water. 
Now, the other, and I think is, you know, is the biggest drawback to this idea of working from powder clay, is that clay takes a long time for the water to get right down into the particles, into those platelets. And the more that it's into the platelets, the more malleable it is, the more sticky and the more pliable it is. Um, so, you know, those of you who've done kind of a bit of a lot of clay work and probably know this well, that the more you age your clay, the better its workability. So actually using fresh clay, freshly mixed clay, um, doesn't extrude very well. It extrudes and tends to crack up. Uh, and that's why I tend to work from a bag of clay. So that's already been sort of, it's been sitting with some water in it and I can add more water to that. And then by making sure that that's well mixed in, um, it seems to, you know, sort of work well. Uh, I have to say my own policy is I, I actually mix up the paste clay uh, and keep it in bags. And the longer I keep it, the better the, the clay seems to be. Um, so then another thing that kind of comes out with these clays is, again, uh, this sort of aubergine color. Um, I've measured the clay so that it's all, I took my six samples, all the same consistency. So each little lump of paste was the same sort of consistency. Uh, and then I pressed it through a pipe and was measuring how much pressure it takes the clay to go down the pipe. Um, uh, and uh, because we're doing extrusions, obviously, the better the clay extrudes, the less pressure you need to do this. Uh, now, design of um, machine, the Lutten machine, actually, this isn't such a problem because the clay container is very close to the nozzle, so it gets pressed out quite easily. But in the... Um, uh, wasp machine, the clay has to pass through quite a long tube. So you've got to get a balance between having the clay soft enough to go down the tube, uh, but not so soft that it actually doesn't build. Um, and uh, now coming back to that stickiness that I was to talking about earlier, about the size of the particle, is um, that China clay has some of the biggest particles to it. Um, and that, so that passes down the pipe quite well. It's not very sticky, you know, pl pl um, china clay that is used for making porcelain clay is difficult to work with as opposed to terracotta clay or ball clay, you know, that are all finer particle clays. The finer the particle, the easier it is to tend to work with. Um, but the china clay actually doesn't take a lot of pressure, 3.6, to get it down the pipe. Now, interestingly, porcelain goes down the pipe the easiest because anyone who knows the formula for porcelain, half of porcelain is, in fact, isn't clay. It is feldspar and silica, of which they pass through a pipe very easily because they're not as sticky clays to the stuff. They're just more like um, um, dough. Um, so porcelain goes through very easily. Ball clay that is kind of a finer version of china clay went through reasonably easily. Then stoneware went down sort of reasonably easily as well. And that is because of the amount of grog in it. As soon as you start adding grog, it goes through the pipes easier. Then the coarse stoneware and the red clay, particularly very sticky, not happy going down the pipes, not extruding awfully well. The, I, I find the clays with about 30% grog work best. Um, and so the, the grog helps the clay to extrude, you know, sort of that's not too sticky. And that then once that it has been extruded, it helps the clay sort of stand up. It gives the, the clay a bit of bones to standing up. Uh, and then it also helps with the drying. You know, as I said, that um, some big particles help the water to come out from the clay easier. So, a big, uh, you know, sort of a clay with high grog in it dries quicker. So actually what I, to set up the machines, I went into the clay store and I just got out, you know, a range of clays that I thought were pretty close. And I squeezed out a little pipe of clay and I just stood them in the studio and I left them to stand there. And my choice was the one that would dry the quickest. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, we came down on this. Oh, I'm sorry, I forget the name of it now, but we'll, when I'm, in the studio, we'll work out which clay it is. There's something 700. <laughs> um, anyway, so for measuring the clay, this is the kind of instrument that I've cobbled together. Um, and it's a piece of reinforcing rod that I have cut 
to be 200 grams. So the weight is what's really important. And again, this is documented. You'll just see at the end, I've got a, a guide to 3D printing and I've documented all that. And so I've ground away a 60 degree angle to it. And then from the point, I've made a little mark at 10 centimeters. And then I've got this guide pipe. So this is just a hollow pipe. And then as you can see, the, the spike goes inside the pipe. I lift the spike so that this guide here is sitting just there. So then the point will be 10 centimeter down. And so basically the principle is you drop a 200 gram spike 10 centimeters into your clay, you take it out and then you measure by how far the, the, the spike went into the clay. And uh, it's you know a wonderful simple machine or a bit of tech, whatever, I forgot, you know, with tools, et cetera. Um, but somewhere between three centimeters, 30 millimeters, sorry, I just that, to three and a half centimeters seems to be the right sort of consistency. Now, I, you know, for a phase recently been using uh, more of a stone, you know, just a, a kind of a mixed stoneware, ball clay, clay, and uh, that seemed to work well with about th um, 32 millimeter, 3.2 centimeter you know, sort of uh, drop here. I then I had some porcelain and I thought I wanted to do some porcelain work. I went over to porcelain and I actually found that the porcelain seemed to work better, slightly hard, around three millimeter. So in other words, it didn't drop in quite as far. So again, I think different clays will, you know, sort of work better. But anyway, th this instrument just gives you sort of an objective reading of what consists, sort of some idea of what the consistency of your clay is. Now, whether Mark, the technician who supports um, clay printing, has made one of these spikes or not, so whether there's one hanging around the studio, I don't know, but I'll, I'll bring mine down when I, when, when I come. Um, so that was my measure for the consistency of clay. Uh, then this is just a little bit of information about, again, you know, all of this is just kind of uh, details about the material quality of clay. And um, you can see it's a plastic container. This is a different system that I use with the Chinese machine here. Is um, I mixed up my clay and then took some food coloring and just colored a little wad of green clay and then a bit of blue clay. And so when I layered the clay into the container, I put a bit of gray clay, obviously, and then my wad of green, and then the gray, and then the blue, and then applied the pressure from behind. And this was air pressure. But in actual fact, if you used a RAM system that we won't be using, but a RAM you know, is the same, you apply the pressure. And obviously, the clay then gets pr pressed down the pipe, heading off down to the extrusion. And in detail, you can see it's really interesting to see just how the extrusion of clay goes through. So as I say, it's not as though the whole of the end just immediately pops down the tube. Some gets kind of left behind and it's um, a kind of a path of least resistance feeding down the tube here. Um, and so anyway, this is to try and answer a little bit. Um, uh, anyway, there are artists who've you know, use colored clay, I've used colored clay, and we do this sort of striation within our prints. Um, and you won't get a sharp definition, even if you um, fill up your clay container with sharp definitions, you won't get a, a sharp uh, transition from one color to the next because you get this kind of mixing going on as the clay is pressed down here. And then the image at the bottom is to kind of represent what I call dewatering. And again, it's just another phenomenon of clay. And that is that clay, when it's under pressure, actually um, stiffens up against the outside of the container because the liquid kind of a bit like a sponge gets sort of squeezed towards the center and the softer clay will take um, the path of least resistance. Um, and uh, so what's happening here is that if you are using the big clay container on, say, the wasp machine, you'll find, and you're printing over a couple of days, you'll find that you'll slowly need more and more pressure to actually force it through. Because in actual fact, the clay is stiffening up on the edges of the container. 
and the water has been sort of driven off going down the middle of the pipe. Now, in actual fact, the more grog you've got in your clay, the more this happens, you know, a kind of sponge type um, situation, that the finer the clay particle, red clays tend not to be able to have the water pushed out of them as much as very open sort of groggy stoneware clays. Um, but anyway, this is a phenomenon, and you know, when you come to open your clay container, you always find at the end the clay that's left behind has actually got really hard. And you're left thinking, well, why, you know, where's the water gone? Um, and the water has been pressed down, you know, with clay that has already exited. Anyway, dewatering is something that happens, and um, in the industry, they, they do filter pressing, and that is a way of drying out clay. You know, they take a clay slurry and they pump it into machines under high pressure, and they literally drive the water off it to get pack, packs of clay ready for, um, for working with. Um, Right, so now it's on to this area of clay consistency. You know, ultimately, this has comes with experience. We now have the measure of the little spike, and as I say, I can tell you to, you know, do your measurement of, you know, around sort of three centimetre, three and a half centimetres in that ballpark. Um, but even within that, you know, it was a matter of intuitively, you think, ah, the harder the clay that I extrude or work with, the more it's going to stand up. The trouble is that, as illustrated in these images, as the clay gets harder, the extrusion as it comes out of the nozzle and onto the form, it gets these little cracks on it. Harder clay tends to crack up. And then if um, you know a straight cylinder is pretty sound um, uh, construction that stays standing up, but if there's any uh, kind of curve to your shape, then these little cracks may well, if under pressure, start opening up, and then that's when you get some uh, things falling apart. So my attitude, you know, and it's only mine, everyone can work to their own, is I actually work slightly on the softer side, because you can see the extrusion is then much smoother and you get a bit of quality. And then once it's extruded, I then immediately put a bit of warm air onto it and try and solidify the shape. Um, so again, you know, this is having mixed up those, those clays, is trying them, and you'll get to see this shape quite a lot. I've just got a little test piece that, I don't know, it's eight centimeter high, I think. It's got a, a corner on one side, it's got texture on the other, it's got an overhang on the other. Um, and uh, so with my soft clay, I tried printing it, and also this was clay that I had just mixed up from powder. Um, so it was really short clay, it wasn't the kind of clay you might want to be printing with. Um, but it was to sort of set up this, uh, these tests to see kind of what worked best. Very soft clay, collapsed. Very hard clay, also collapsed because it tended to crack apart. And, you know, there's a sweet spot is somewhere in between where it sort of built better. It started breaking down on the overhangs, but um, anyway. So then uh, there's been a lot of discussion around so additives. What can you see, add to the clay to improve uh, its um, uh, printability or its sort of extrusion qualities? So over here was the test from this previous, nothing added at all. Um, and then there'd been uh, some discussion about sodium dispex. So that's um, the sort of stuff that you put into casting slip. So there is a logic so that if you could use cast and slip or something like casting, a stiff casting slip, it's going to have less water in it, in which case it's going to dry quicker and that, that, that'll be great. The trouble is that it also then becomes, thrips, 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 I can't pronounce it as you gather, but it's that quality that it kind of goes like jelly. If you leave it overnight, you go to your casting slip and it looks solid. You switch on the blade or the mixer or you put your hand in and it just breaks down into a liquid. And that's what you know, the sodium dispex does. Or this, um, oh, I won't get the name now, but anyway. Um, and so in actual fact, you want to avoid using casting slips won't work. And you have to, particularly working in porcelains, you need to make sure that your porcelain is always slightly on the acid side and not on the alkaline side. So this is in fact an alkaline, um, and uh, it's uh, you know is used as I say to make it into casting slip. So some porcelain clays I've actually very consciously added um, um, 
uh, vinegar too, you know, an acid obviously, and that makes sure that it's 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 not doesn't go um, turn like casting slip at all. Um, anyway, small amounts of sodium dispex. So this, you know, sort of for casting slip, it'll be like three, four uh, percent that you need to add. Um, I think, but a point one of a percent. I think actually, you know, from this example over to this example did help. It it um, re it releases the electronic bonds between the clay uh, in which and it then extrudes slightly smoother. So there's something to be had in there, but I have to say I don't get involved in there it, it, with uh, dispex or, or um, any of those um, things. Uh, discussion around adding paper, some sort of fiber that would help, you know, sort of bond it together, it won't fall apart so easily. Um, I think it was improvement on not having anything. All I did here was just take some toilet paper and with a, uh, a fluid a food blender, uh, blended the paper and then added by weight, you know, sort of 1% of, of, of fiber. Interesting texture. I know somebody out in um, uh, uh, Latvia who uses a lot of paper fiber clay um, and printed and, and, you know, gets nice textures with this. But, but the real big, you know, kind of eye opener for me was the addition of bentonite. So um, for those of you who don't know, bentonite is a plasticizer. It's a kind of clay um, and uh, gets added particularly to porcelain to make it more workable. Uh, so it's a very, very sticky, fine, fine clay. Um, so you don't add a lot of it, but you can see just from these samples here. So, you know, I added 5% bentonite into this mix of clay. And as I said, unfortunately, I was doing all this from um, uh, dry clay, which was the way I could do the measurements and so on and so forth. But all of a sudden, I started getting a print that would actually print complete. Um, so, you know, the, the takeaway from all of this is that the more plastic your clay is, the better it's going to extrude and the better it's then, you know, or the less it's going to break up when, you, when you're printing. Um, so that was all kind of clay qualities and the material properties. This is about nozzle size. Um, and again, you know, we will just, you, you'll meet the machines and they'll have nozzles on them. And to begin with, you just get on with the nozzle that's on there and so on and so forth. And I tend to use a two millimeter nozzle. So this photograph at the back, a bit difficult to read, but <coughs> um, the thicker nozzles in the front, a three millimeter nozzle, two millimeter nozzle, 1.6, and I think a one millimeter nozzle right at the back. So you can see they're getting the walls getting thinner as it goes to the back. And then from right to left, it's the slice height. So this is the kind of the, um, ratio you're trying to work out is that how big should each layer be for the size of the nozzle? And obviously, as the nozzle gets bigger, then the layer height also gets bigger. So it is about kind of a, a ratio. Um, and on the right hand side, I made the um, layer height very tight. And then on the left hand side, I open it out to the point that if it's, you know, sort of if the layer height is the same as the nozzle size, then it doesn't start building and it breaks up. And you can see in each of these is as the layer height gets too big, you start getting, you know, it falling apart. So there's a sweet spot sort of in a diagonal somewhere through here. Uh, this is my test piece, as I, I was talking about. I've got a sharp edge. It's just to try and sort of see how precise the different nozzle sizes were. Then I got what I call an overhang. So this is a 45 degree, was to see how well that would print, and then a texture um, to see how well that would print. Uh, and the sample along the bottom is actually printed, I think, on a double layer as well, just to make sure. So, you know, that's your ideal potential print. So edge, edge crispness, this is, you know, that if you're doing slip casting, you make a sharp, um, uh, a good precise model, you take a mold from that, you take a cast from that, you get nice sharp edges, no problem. Sharp edges is something you're not going to get very easily with in ceramic 3D printing. One, the clay is very soft the whole time. But inevitably, any edge can only be as sharp as the size of the nozzle that you've been using. So here you can see I'm using a one millimeter nozzle, and those are the edges. And over here is a three millimeter nozzle, and that's the edge. And it's you know kind of got the circumference of a three millimeter nozzle. 
Uh, and then what's also going on here is the proportion of the layer height. So the sharpness, the layer height doesn't seem to affect the sharpness, but it does affect the overhang. Um, and again, here, you know, go, going from left to right, the layer height is slowly getting bigger in each nozzle. Um, and you, so you can see here is the big nozzle, and you can see the layers are getting visually and bigger. Um, and again, you've just got to work through. I find a proportion of about the um, one to three. In other words, if the nozzle is, you know, sort of um, one wide, then the layer height will be 0.3 of that in height. So you squash it down much more than the width of it. Um, and uh, so this was the graph I finally made up. Um, and so this is this ratio between extrusion height and extrusion width. Now, inevitably, the kind of the gray represents the nozzle. The clay actually squidges a bit wider than the nozzle does. So, you know, I had the nozzle side and then I had the kind of the extrusion size uh, and then did some division. And it actually turns out that as proportionally, as your nozzles get bigger, then the proportion actually might get bigger as well. You can see the proportion of this height to these heights uh, is, is much flatter. Um, because the whole time, what you're trying to do is get a wall that can start building out at an angle. Now, the logic here is that you can see if it's a big layer height, then there's only a small bit of attachment between each one, and it's likely to fall over. So the less the, la the layer height, the bigger the connection, and the more stable it's going to be. And then, as I say, what I do is I build two walls next to each other, um, so one, you get this nice overlap, a kind of cantilever, uh, and then you get much more grip between each layer. Um, and it's just that if you get, uh, you know, particularly something like this is potentially going to crack during firing, uh, during drying, and then particularly firing. So you don't want to get layer delamination later on during your process. Um, so anyway, yeah, about one third seems to be a, a good indicator. So um, I tend to use a two millimeter nozzle and I lay a height at about 0.8. So I think that's more than one third, but anyway, somewhere around there. <laughs> um, uh, print speed, again, the question is, okay, how fast can you print these? There's a little bit, obviously, depending on the quality of your machine, how fast the machine can go, um, but, uh, I did the series of tests. So vertically is each test. Um, and I've just turned it to have a look at the different qualities on each side. This here is printed, and this is a setting that is on the Cura. It says 10 millimeters per second. And so the print took me 42 minutes to do. Then the next one, double the speed, obviously 20. So it took me half the time to do. And then a 30 millimeter per second, 40 millimeter per second. So you can see 12 minutes to do the print rather than 42. So when you sort of sit, sit and watch this, the machine is actually distorting the clay quite a lot as it prints, and it looks all quite of a mess. But really interesting that once it's all dried, you know, sort of bone dry and photographed, you literally can't see any difference in the finished quality over all the different speeds. So, you know, the takeaway is print at whatever speed is comfortable with you. What I will say is that the closer, the smaller the circumference of your object, the smaller the object is the slower you need to work. And that's a little bit because it comes round very quickly and then layers up so much quicker. And so there's very little time for the clay to dry. Um, so in actual fact, if I'm doing more of a spherical object on this machine behind me, I actually set the speed at 80 millimeters per second. So, you know, the print speed is pretty fast. But when I start my print, I slow the machine down. There's a button on it that you turn it right down. And I'm printing at half that speed. So I start quite small because the circumference is quite small. And then as the circumference gets bigger, I can speed up, speed up. And then in actual fact, the layers are only building at the same sort of speed that they probably were later down, L lower down. It's just, you know, the clay's got a long way to go on each extrusion. Hopefully you're following the logic of that, okay. Um, so, uh, and then on the right-hand side is going back to this trying to 
um, you know, understand would really stiff clay be useful. Um, so I started with here's my kind of print clay. Then the next one is um, like a hard printing clay that I don't use so much. And then actually a clay sort of like out of the throwing, throwing bag, something that you could throw with. And then a clay that is quite difficult to print, uh, to, to even sort of throw with or, or wedge. So this clay here, I was needing to use a mechanical ram to press it through the machine. Um, and in actual fact, you can see as the clay gets stiffer, the sort of the overhang sags more. And I think it's more visible on this one. So this is, again, my kind of ideal print, two walls thick, my consistency of clay, you know, just to prove that a 45-degree bowl is printable. So then I put in the soft clay, just one layer of clay being sort of coil built, and it, you know, let it run until it broke down, and it broke down at that point. Then the throwing consistency clay broke down at that point, and the hard throwing clay broke down at this point. All of this at an angle. If you were printing vertically, then you know, no problem. Stiffest clay would probably be best, but I'm looking to do you know, these organic shapes that I do. Um, and uh, again, you know, kind of this defies logic a bit. You'd think, oh, the stiffer the clay, the better. But um, I think what's going on is that the clay coming out of the extruder is obviously stiff. And so that is distorting the clay that it's been deposited on more than if it is soft clay. So if your extrusion is soft, it can then settle onto a soft wall quite nicely and hopefully is stiffening up that wall. But as the clay gets stiffer, then the extrusion is stiffer and it distorts the clay underneath more. Again, no idea whether you followed that, but that's my logic too. So then the question of kind of scale, and obviously, you know, this will, the, the process will work from this kind of scale right through to houses that we've been shown. Um, you know, and wonderfully, all the software that's in the machines, be it for this scale, or the house building is the same, basically the same software, the same um, um, work process and everything else. What does change is obviously your nozzle size. I mean, this is a 0.06 of a millimeter using porcelain, so that's going through. Um, and uh, what you do need to do is obviously change the size of your printhead as well. So this has got a very small screw to it. Um, then I have a you know sort of a tabletop printer from Wasp that's got another size printhead to it, and then I've got this bigger machine behind me that's got another printhead to it. So you certainly have to change the screw because that's the amount of force that's been, been delivered and so on and so forth. Um, so it's all very scalable. Um, and again, people ask about what we call infill or you know, closing over the top. So these are all techniques that are used in plastic printing. Obviously as a vessel maker, you know, I just tend to think like this open box thing here. Um, but if you were wanting to get involved in printing things more like plastic printers would do, um, I didn't do a shot with it open, but there's what we call info. So, you know, the box is made in my modeling program. You then put it to Cura and you tell the slicing program that you want info. And it then builds these walls inside. You can just see the marks where these uh, walls are. So there's the walls inside this as well. And you set it at about 30% info. You know, you'd have to experiment with your software, so how much. Um, and it builds the walls inside so that when you then build the top, it sort of builds across. Um, and I think that's about three layers going across. So you could, you know, and, and it would have printed a base as well, sort of three layers, prints a layer, and then uh, on the diagonal to that, it prints a layer, and then prints a layer, and then prints all the info, but hollow, and then it starts printing the top to that as well. Okay. So ultimately with the, you know, all those kind of settings that I've been going through, this is what you're trying to do, is get a clay that will really stand up to what we call bridging. Um, and uh, so you can imagine, you know, to get this, it's the quality of the clay, the consistency of the clay, the size of the nozzle in relation to how fast the clay is then flowing out of that. 
So um, if uh, it's flowing too fast, then this would collapse. If the clay was too dry or not the right consistency, it would collapse. I can just move the video on a bit. Now, inevitably, you get a little bit of sag, um, but uh, as it builds up, it then kind of solidifies itself. So it is kind of possible to print horizontally for a while anyway. Um, so these are stills taken from the same one, you know, that's, that's that uh, video. And um, I think this gap here is about a centimeter and a half, nearly three, and I think about three, four and a half centimeters. Okay. So the actual print process, this is obviously now the kind of the way I work, I work again, you know, develop your own as to how you want. This year, I think actually there is a bit of wire in here, but you can see there's quite a kind of cantilever coming off here that um, it, it will slowly build, particularly if the edges are all, you know, very close together. Um, sort of uh, holes within the piece is not, you know, a problem, but doable, very curved shapes, all doable. Um, over here, you can see there's some propping going on here. Um, and that, you can see it over here. If it is a piece of plastic print, in the slicing program, you would then switch on support and it would build little trees, you know, that would be printed by the plastic printer and that those trees would help support this overhang. Now, if you try and do that in clay, those little kind of virtual trees that are wasted, you cut them away afterwards, um, are just too soft and they tend to fall over and so on and so forth. So what I do here is that in the visualization that I get in the Cura program, I run the um, slider up and down. And so I look out for where I'm going to get an area that is unsupported. Okay, so this was supported as a kind of it's not easy to see on this photograph, but uh, there is a 45 degree or a sort of an angle building out of here. So this managed to support itself. But obviously over here, all of a sudden in midair, the printing wanted to start printing. Now I'd made a mental note of that and I'd got some clay ready and I just sort of, when the machine went across and started extruding clay in midair, I then built the little tree and I just hold it there until it comes back and make sure it's in the right place. And then away we go. So, you know, I technically just build my own support. And then you can see some other little supports in here just to sort of make sure that stuff doesn't fall down. And I think that's all on there. So here you can see again, you know, this is the biggest form, probably 30, might be 40 centimeter across, probably 30 centimeter across. I knew that there were gonna be some pieces that started in midair. So I'd got my props ready um, and, uh, I, you know, I say props, I actually do use kiln props. I, I, of late I've been using, because they've got a nice weight to them. So I just put in a kiln prop and might put a bit of clay on top to, you know, because they're never quite the right size. But then what I also do is I lay in pieces of wire. And so that will help bond across. So, you know, this piece here, as it grew up, it would be quite sort of soft and wobbly. Um, and by crisscrossing with wire, I can get shapes to hold together. And then as I say, the whole time, this is a smaller printer, obviously, but I use the same heater on my big printer. This is a little space heater. It's, uh, you know, one, it's not really, really hot air. Uh, you know, certainly glue guns are too hot to dry with, um, because if you dry the pieces too fast, you then end up often with cracking. So I'm just playing a little bit of hot air onto the pieces the whole time. Now also with hot air, once you start, you really should keep going because if you switch the air on and off, you start getting distortion as well. Now inevitably, there's just no way that, you know, I showed you that graphic of the layers of clay building up. There is a point on the horizontal where just each layer won't start sticking to the layer in, underneath. Uh, and so I just live with that. I'm always, you know, on these rounded forms, I'm going to get holes. So I've got just a, you know, um, a medical syringe sitting in the background here. I mix up some soft clay, put it in the syringe. I have a needle of the same size as my needle I'm using. So I just finish that off by hand, bit of analog printing. 
Um, and then you can see with a, uh, a hacksaw blade, I've just, once it's leather hard, just scraped it away. Um, I think at college there, you will probably have access mainly to the Luton machines. And the Luton machines have got, oh, I can't remember. I think it's about a one liter container to it. And that will do um, are probably nearly 15 cubic centimeters of shape kind of thing. Um, but this is, you know, one thing, if you really get into it, you, you have to come to terms with, and that is the amount or the volume of clay you get or you use as you scale up. That I think uh, intuitively we tend to think of scaling just in two dimensions. You know, that you've got an object, you double its size, okay, it's going to use twice as much material. No, it actually doesn't use double the amount of material, it uses cubic amount of material. Because not only does it double in the width, it also doubles in the depth. And also, as you get bigger, the walls are probably going to get thicker as well. So it is actually quite sort of, um, I want to say frightening, but that's a bit grand, uh, grandiose. Um, it's, it's rather surprising just how quickly the amount of clay, incre the amount of clay that you use increases as you scale up. Um, and uh, so bigger objects, you really want to have a bigger container. Um, and in actual fact, what I'm doing here is I've, on the Cura, you get a, a, a sort of a bit of a readout of as to how much material it's going to use. Uh, and I've made some notes as to, you know, what I've built with one container of clay. So I kind of know what the reading is. And I tend to scale these um, uh, vases to the size of the container so that I didn't have to change over material. So anyway, this container of clay would make this, this object in each of these bases. Obviously, the lids are less of a problem. Now, it's not a problem to um, stop, you know, pause. I think I said this last week, to pause and change over the container. I mean, even this, this container, I will pause the machine so it, it lifts away and it just sits there for a while. I undo the clay container, and then I would have already prepared clay, but I, I open it all up, refill it with clay, and then get going again, and then come down and get printing, printing again. You, you tend to get a bit of a scar, but often that can be worked off later on. Uh, and then as I said, some pieces, I also just rather cut it in two and print two sections, and then at leather hard, put it together rather than having to do the, the clay changeover. But working with a Luton machine, you can load up lots of canisters and you just hit pause, take off one canister, put on the next canister and away you go. Okay, I think that's uh, all about the process. Now this is just flagging up kind of information. Um, there is a, an online sort of uh, community for clay 3D printing uh, on a website called Wikifactory. Um, and um, excuse me, having my um, profile there, but it's uh, ceramic 3D printing is what you want to be looking for at Wikifactory. Um, it originally was on a Google group, and that was much easier access and this, that, and the other, but then Google stopped that we closed down all their communities. Uh, so Dries van Bruggen moved it over to the Wikifactory. Uh, and then, you know, on there, I've got a whole lot of information, uh, uh, but particularly it's uh, a guide to clay 3D printing. And from all the workshops I've done, I've tried to kind of write it up. Um, but then that, uh, this guide is also available on my website. So if you find the website under clay 3D printing, there's a free to download um, document there. And that's got, you know, all this sort of research information uh, in that. So that's actually the guide or the image of the guide. Then also, as I was saying earlier, I've got YouTube, um, obviously sort of lectures of mine. Back here is the video of build your own machine. So that's, you know, what, eight years ago, in six, six minutes, you can see how to build a 3D printer. Um, I also, from teaching I did in, in um, Reykjavik, uh, there are, I think, 11 tutorials on working with Blender. Um, and for the person who was asking about sculpting, uh, there's certainly one tutorial on sculpting that you might just look at there. Um, again, a, a bit like the talk I gave earlier, it's really the bottom level. I mean, I, I hope it's not too simplistic, but it's about getting people kind of off the ground. Um, because I think that online, there's masses of, of really clever working with Blender. 
But what I did find was what was lacking was that sort of the initial sort of really just using points and surface and and so and 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 more towards clay work as well. So there's there all that, and then um, I did just want to point out this one. So this is the the Cura, the software that does the slicing. There's a video on setting it up for clay. Right, I think I'm nearly there. So my kind of if you have to have a quote at the end of all of this is for all the material knowledge and the technique and process and you know as you over the kind of four lectures I've really gone into that. Um, I still feel the bottom line is ultimately about your personal expression and the communication. I, I think unless you're actually saying something with your work that an audience out there kind of can read and understand and want to understand, you know, all of this is a waste of time. So personal expression, communication is what it is for me. So thank you.